Virginia in particular has, has to offer us. And it asks one of the most quintessential questions. How can a man know his place in the world and order himself towards that end? And it's by asking this question that the book, of, that the book becomes universally accessible. It reminds me of Nathaniel Hawthorne when he's talking about children's books, right? He says that children possess an unestimated sensibility to whatever is deeper high in imagination or feeling, so long as it is simple likewise. And that's what the Western is for us. We're able to grasp onto this idea of how to find our proper level in the world through the Western. Now, my claim is that the Virginian portrays uh, the maturation of a man in every respect, that is respect to the um, animals, men, and God, to learning to play the game ever better. All right, so what is meant by game? What's meant by maturation? I'm going to hit upon those points, give definitions, and in addition to that, I'll go into also something closely related, uh, although it might not seem like it, this kind of darkness in the upper world. All right, now, firstly, um, the game. Uh, if you look at your second quote in your quote sheet, to play a game is to engage in activity directed towards bringing about a specific state of affairs, using only means permitted by specific rules, where the means permitted by the rules are more limited in scope than they would be in the absence of the rules, and where the sole reason for accepting such limitations is to make possible such activity. So long story short, the game is a means to an end. And I claim that the game is any interaction a man has with other men, animals, God. I think that's a really interesting take that, that Lister has on uh, has for his literature. You know, when we normally read the book, we look at the interactions between men almost exclusively. Uh, but it's yeah, it's the fact that he goes into this dichotomy of the three. Yeah, and this game is all directed towards the maturation of the man, right? And I define maturation as being able to interact with a kind of the, the, all the darkness that's involved in the world, right? While simultaneously being able to preserve your innocence. Now, we're going to, um, and, and in regards to the book, right, where is it talking about game? You flip to almost any. Any page in the Virginia, you're going to find uh, you're going to find either the word itself, the game, or some sort of play analogy. Um, I mean, there's three three chapters um, dedicated to this idea of game, the game and the nation, right? And they're kind of central in the plot there. And when Molly, uh, Molly, the love interest of the Virginian, asks, "What is this game you keep talking about?" Like, but what's this poker game you keep talking about? She says, or I'm sorry, the Virginian says, well, it's life, ma'am. Whatever a man was doing in the world of men. And the world of men, like, like I've been saying, isn't, isn't just interactions with men, right? And the author um, quotes Cool uh, Coolridge and says, You prayeth well, who lovest. Who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. Who prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. The dear God, who loveth all, he made and loveth all. So even the author's self, right, is, is there's this intentionality about showing all the different aspects um, of the game in relation to the man and God. It's very intentional, and if we look at a couple of examples, we can see how those interactions actually cause a man to mature, to level up, right? If we think about um, Shorty, for instance, right? He's the, the the kid from the East Coast who kind of lost, um, doesn't have really any agency of his own. Um, is easily swayed by the cattle wrestler or the cowboy. It doesn't really matter. He kind of he has no 
almost no will, no say in anything he does. He just, um, yeah. And there's not a lot redeeming about his character, except for the fact that he loves his horse, Pedro. He loves his horse with almost a, um, the same love that someone would love a child. But when he calls him, you know, my dear Pedro, my, my little, little Pedro. Right? And even the Virginian says it's it's awfully it's awfully sorrowful that he's in with the wrong crowd because he's so nice to his horse. There's something redeeming about his character there. <clears throat> like there's, and then if we look at uh, the Virginian, we see he calls his mommy horse endearing terms like pie biter, right? He, and he even goes over to his horse um, for consolation. He's his friend. There's this companionship he has with the horse. And then in the, one of the first scenes, we see the Virginian uh, interacting um, with, with animals is when we have the scene um, where the Virginian, he's picking up the greenhorn who came from the East Coast, and he's going to go drop them off at the judge's house, right? That's what the judge is entrusting with. And he's using these Mustangs to pull his, his uh, cart. And when all of a sudden, uh, the wild horses decide we're gonna make we're gonna make a run for it, and throughout there's like you you have to think that the horses must be suicidal because they almost go off a cliff, they run through a river, and then they end up in this huge tangle of aspen woods. Right? It's just it's one of the most stressful scenes, honestly. <laughs> even even the uh, the shootout at the end isn't as stressful. <laughs> but um, yeah. But we notice the entire time that Virginia's got a very placid manner about him. He's very calm. He, he tells the greenhorn, yeah, don't jump off the cart. It's better to stay in the cart. Don't worry about your luggage. It's in the river. It's Honestly, it's probably safer there right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll get through this. Just, it's all right. Just write it out. And the entire time, the Virginian is in control of himself, even if he can't fully control the situation. And then finally, once everything has stopped, he's able to inspect everything. It's the only time we get any sort of emotion from him, other than, you know, being calm. He, he exclaims, gentlemen, hush! <laughs> um, yeah, and he, said, he even talks to the horse and says, you know, most people would beat you, and there'd be nothing wrong with that. You know what? And I would do that, too. Except, I know it wouldn't do you any good. He even makes a defense to the greenhorn, saying, this was this was awful, and every once in a while, Mustangs will have a fit. But they're really good horses. That's why the judge had me use these horses specifically to pick you up. They're good horses. Every once in a while, they'll just have a fit. They'll be ornery, and then they're good for the next few months. But then let's compare that with Balaam, right? Balaam is such an evil and savage individual that even the cowpunchers use his name as a term for abuse. He's Balaam, the maltreater of horses. Right? And in the scene where we have Balaam and the Virginian rounding up uh, the judge's horses, right? and again, they, these horses are on the wild side. They've been uh, left to graze for too long. And instead of and instead of using his reason and realizing, okay, these horses are going to have to treat this differently, you know, he instead decides, no, they can't get away from me, right? I'm going to make sure they do what I want or else. <laughs> and this rage that he has, right, when, he, when his reality and the reality of the world aren't matching up, is he's foaming at the mouth. He's, He's flustered, he's deaf, he can't hear any reason. Uh, the Virginian tries to say, hey, that's not going to work. <coughs> and all that happens is he just turns around and the Virginian sees he's got a face like a maniac. He's not even perceiving what's going on. He's just savage. And it's not just in the moment that he allows his passions to control him. He even makes a, a defense for himself by saying, the Western pony." Is man's greatest enemy. Right? It doesn't seem to see, understand that part of his nature as being a man is to steward a creature. 
right, and to work with the nature that is there. Instead, he, he desires the power and domination, whereas the Virginian is guiding the nature, even of the, the honoring horses. In regards to, um, yeah, it, to maturation, we see that the Virginian, in a sense, has mastered and kind of leveled up um, in the world of animals, right? He, and we see how that bleeds out into how he interacts with human beings, right? The entire chapter where he's taming the, those wild horses um, with the greenhorn, he's called the trustworthy man. Almost every other line, the trustworthy man. He's the trustworthy man. The judge is trustworthy man. It's <laughs> it gets ridiculous. <laughs> but we see with Balaam, we know exactly what kind of man he is, not just in regards to how he treats animals, but in regards to how he treats men. He he swindles Shorty out of his beloved horse Pedro, for example. And it's a bad deal. Everyone can see it's a bad deal Balaam's giving Shorty, but Shorty's just a helpless little idiot. <laughs> and then, of course, Balaam leaves the Virginian for dead. Not necessarily out of any sake of self-preservation, but just he doesn't want to save the Virginian. It's too much trouble for him. Now, in regards to how a man interacts with other men, I'm going to use the example of Molly and the Virginian. Now, the Virginian, before he meets Molly, hates the idea of marriage, women, children, settling down. He sees women as this plaything, right? We, we see the interaction he has with the biscuit shooter, the waitress in Medicine Bow. He could more or less care less about her, despite, yeah, despite the fact that he's happy to go and be welcomed by her and what have you. And even in the letter that he writes his soon-to-be mother-in-law, which I don't, I don't know how prudent that was, but he, he says, you know, in, in the way of women, I was not a boy. I, I, I have full knowledge of the world of women. <laughs> and yet, yeah, and, and we see that he even says that this the coming of women in the West is going to destroy the cowboy game. Right? It's no place for women and children. Women and children don't belong in the West. And this is a world for men. Right? And he teases his friends who are married and in, in a very demeaning manner. Like, yeah, you're kind of less now. You know, you've, you've lost your manhood. You've lost your man card. <laughs> um, yeah, after he meets Molly, he, he's, he decides, I need to, there's something there that I want, that I desire, that I need to work towards. And he even tells her point blank, you know, when I was a kid, I hated learning. However, I'm going to level up, and it kind of levels up. I'm going to become your best scholar. And read as many books as I can and have wonderful conversations with you. And by the end of this, you're going to love me. <laughs> right? And, and we see, he, he does. He, he devours Shakespeare and Kennelsworth and has these great conversations with Molly. And he becomes her equal. And now, he, he does this for this bettering of himself to come out of himself. To, like, he's already his ability or self-sufficiency, but he needs to come out of himself and realize, okay, I've got the foundation, but I need to build something more, because that's another part of what it means to, to be a man, right? Is you're a steward, you need self-sufficiency, but you also need other people, right? And we compare that to Trampas, right? He talks about women in a demeaning manner, right? He badmouths Molly. And What's more, the only companions he has is, uh, the only reason he has companionship is for the end of cattle wrestling, improving his, his position. It's not for the better, bettering of himself actually, but more a grasp for power. Again, we get this 
image of a domineering type versus someone who's trying to work with their nature. And then finally, in regards to um, interaction with God, right, we, we don't get too much of that because uh, we, we just start to really enter into that level of the game. Um, and we get this, um, this image of the, the person who, who's this minister who comes and he's all fire and brimstone and nobody likes him because he tells the cowboys, you're damned from the beginning. And if you try to better your position, you're still damned. <laughs> and Virginia hates this idea. There's something deep down in him. He, he knows two things. Firstly, there's someone who must have made those beautiful mountains out there. Picture as sunset. However, I reckon he plays a square game with us if he plays at all. But that's only fair. And that's why so many of the cowboys love the bishop. The bishop who uses this loving, tender approach. And not that he allows, right? Not that he allows for the evil to to go unaddressed. However, you know, he's a very understanding. He works with the nature of the cowboys, much like the Virginian works with the nature of the wild horses. It's, it's for the bettering. Mm -hmm. Now, in regards to the darkness I had mentioned earlier, right, we, we actually kind of begin to question how on earth could the Virginian really be a hero? Right, especially when we start considering how his yeah his, like his interaction with with women right he, like he blatantly said earlier yeah I, I, I know my way around I, I've, I've been around how can he be a hero if he's the type who's killed in the past he says not for pleasure but still he's you know he kills Trampus and that's in the duel, and despite the fact we know that Trampus is the, the bad guy, we, we don't we have trouble with that. There's some lack of justice and <coughs> long ordering of why he eventually does end up killing Trampus. There's something there's something wrong about that, right? And of course, when we look into the when he he swaps the babies, right? The, his big prank, right? That is really odd. But the author notes that it's a devilish, satanic kind of plot in play that the Virginia enters into, right? Because the reason he swaps all the town's children out, causes all this confusion and mayhem, is to get at Molly, who rejected him. There's clearly a lack of maturation there, right? And the first image we're given of the Virginian is, is when the Greenhorn is arriving on train, he sees, he sees the Virginian coming out of um, the crowd of cowboys, and he describes them like a tiger, he just power, muscle upon muscle. Just, And of course, the author continues to go into detail that it's rather maybe too descriptive and makes us all uncomfortable as we're reading it. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, inter it's interesting that the author wants us to tie in this idea of tiger with the Virginian something deadly and terrifying, right? And our editor from the book will notice, or will note that it's like that of Kipling's India, right? The Tiger of Kipling's India. Jungle Book, Shere Khan, this noble creature, capable of great destruction. And it's also like, oh, and, and that tiger, Shere Khan, is influenced by William Blake's poem, Tiger, Tiger, right? Did he who make, uh, did he smile his work to see? Could he make the land make a tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of mine? What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Now, this phenomenon of the hero having a dark side right, is something Jordan Peterson addresses in his talk, The Best Men I Know Are Dangerous Men. If you only know how to behave, you're just a domesticated house cat. You have to pull the darkness back in and allow that to reveal itself within your increasingly sophisticated way of being. He continues, he continues on. 
saying that we need this capacity for evil in order to have this capacity for greatness, right? In a, in a very Thomistic fashion, he relates that to God allowing for evil in the world. Maybe God didn't allow evil, but the potential of evil in the world. Maybe a world with the possibility of evil was a better world than the possibility without evil in the world. Maybe a man is better when he's a dangerous man, who's, be, who's being good, than when he would be if he were just a good man who wasn't capable of being dangerous. The best men I know are dangerous men. You don't mess with them, and you know that as soon as you meet them. Now, just like law needs a force behind it, just like the, the goodness we seek in justice needs some sort of terrifying thing behind it to defend it, so too a man needs the capability to be a ferocious creature, to, to defend his innocence and the innocence of others, right? And therefore, the flaws we see in the Virginian are supposed to look up to those. Rather, we're supposed to see his flaws as his capacity for evil, his ability to have force and agency. Now, I had mentioned maturation before, and my definition of maturation was the ability to interact with yeah, interact with the darkness of the world and become perfected without harming your original innocence, right? And we're going to see this in the book, right? Where's, where's this in, in the book? Well, throughout, sim similarly to how often we see game, we'll see imagery of innocence in childhood, right? The cowboys are referred to as sons of the sagebrush. The the, the Virginian has this boyish delight in his calling. And he even mentions, the, the Virginian even mentions that he expects, I, I expect in many grown-up men, you'd call sensible. There's a little boy sleeping, the little kid that they once was, that still keeps his fear in the dark. Right? And even in, in the book, we hear Christ say, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's this, yeah, there's this sense in which we're supposed to interact with all of the evils of the world and even of ourself, and we're supposed to be able to harness that and use it in order to preserve our, our nature as, as men, right? And we also see, you know, when Shorty is murdered, right? How it weighs on the Virginian. Or when he has to hang his best friend, Steve, for cattle wrestling. We see how much turbulence that causes him. The placid waters of the Virginian become a tempest, and he, he goes on the verge of madness, right? However, despite all of this, the Virginian's innermost thoughts are clean, according to to the author. And now, it, it, again, it's, it's interesting to say that, that they're clean because there's entire songs that the Virginian sings, right, that the, the author won't publish, right, Cause, <laughs> because of subject matter and, uh, and explicit language. We, we're not allowed to, to listen to that. <laughs> right, but that's not to say he doesn't interact Things maybe he shouldn't. However, unlike Trampas, when he badmouths Molly, right, to impugn her reputation, he's not saying it necessarily to, to harm anyone, right? And I, I think that's what's meant there by his innermost thoughts being clean. And as we go throughout the book, we see this constant struggle until the honeymoon scene. That's the only period we get of rest. It's the it's idyllic moment when there's harmony between man and woman, Virginia and Molly, right? There's harmony between them and creatures, right? They, the Virginian won't, isn't allowed to kill the black bear. And he, he, um, for so, he, I, I don't know, I guess he uh, more or less um, 
identifies more with the with the little weasel. He seems, seems like, wow, I, I really understand that guy. I wish I could be that guy. <laughs> yeah, but there's, that's the only moment that they'll come we get. And the more time they spend on this island, we get a vision of, of what Molly sees in the vision. Right? He, he lay extended and serene. And she looked at him and the wonderful change that had come over him like a sunrise. Was this dreaming boy the man two days ago? Man, I feel trying this. Their hours, their hours upon this island had brought this change, filling the space with innocence. Now, I think this is why we love the Western so much, is because it comes from the Virginian, right? This, this first book that kind of showed us how, in a very real way, you must interact with the evil of the world and with the evil inside yourself. Yet, you, sh you can't allow it to consume you. You must preserve your nature. You must preserve your childlike innocence, the nature, the God-given nature. And I think it's the Western that allows us it allows us that freedom to, to realize that that darkness is, is a capacity for good. And I think that's why you should all, if you haven't already, you should reread, you should read the Virginian. <laughs> Thank you very much. mentioned, uh, the Virginian thinks that that this game of men will be destroyed by women and children in the West. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, by the end of the story, is the game over? Yeah. Um, good question. So in a sense, yes, there's a different game being played, right? And the more and more I think about the Virginian, we see that there are multiple levels of different games that are being played all through the, the overarching the overarching thing, what right which is the maturation of each individual person right? but there's a sense yeah that the western game was coming to an end um yeah and and in a sense that can be related right to, to it can be seen as, as a personal experience right we all have this experience of you know, we're children, we finally get out of the, we get out of the house and we're able to go do whatever we want, right? And that's wonderful. We don't want to give that up, of course, until we meet, you know, someone we want to um, meet, someone we want to be with the rest of our lives, right? And there's a sense in which that game of learning how to become self-sufficient, figuring out your place amongst peers, but that game kind of more or less does come to an end. Yeah, so maybe, maybe the, the thing I'm curious about is um, the game is tied up so much with the West, right, in this world that basically doesn't have women and children and also doesn't really have civilization. Right. Right? So back East, the game doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. And once you bring in women and children, the game doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, but it, is there a version of the game that's played out in those in those places and now um and how is that version of the game different than it is in the west right. Right? Um, otherwise you might think that and there has to be some version of the game that's being played now right for this that the book wouldn't be that interesting to us mm -hmm. right? if if somehow we couldn't if there weren't something kind of universal about what's going on there right right yeah but yet there is a lot of particularity, right? Where it's the West, where this uh, version of the game is played. And somehow the game is different once it's somewhere else and in a different time. So what 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 of the game persists now? Gotcha. Yeah. So in regards to yeah. Yeah. So I'd say that what persists still in the game is 
there's a sense in which each of us have, like like the West, like the Virginia, these different states of, um, you know, we've got all this potential, like the West had all this potential when we first came here, right? But, and we didn't want that potential to come to an end. We wanted, we wanted there to still be frontiers and still places to explore and still adventures to be had, right? And it's, <laughs> actually, I, I listen to Jordan Peterson maybe too much, but it reminds me of this um, analogy. Uh, he, he goes into a literary um, critique of Peter Pan, right? In Neverland, there's this, when you're a child and you're younger, you've got all this potential for, um, for anything, right? And Peter Pan doesn't want to let go of that potential, right? He wants to keep playing in that game, right? And that's, yeah. And, and it's not until, you know, he meets Wendy that he has, he kind of has this question of whether or not he should be Neverland, right? And become, actually become a man. Um, but yeah, no, I think in, in a similar way, the West was this kind of a Neverland, right? Um, that, and, and eventually, potential always has to come to an end and become an act, right? And it's it's a death of one thing, but it's the birth of a new and a new adventure, right? Um, yeah, and I think that's what we can draw from that. And there's a sense, yeah, the West has been civilized in, you know, give or take a negative 25 degree days. <laughs> but um, yeah. And there's still little pockets here and there, right, of, of land that can be explored or there are frontiers. But I, I think there's a sense in which it's an analogy for the human condition, right, of closing off potential and starting to act towards an end, right, a, a, some higher end you know, that, that makes the potential worthwhile. Uh, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, and can I ask about uh, another part of the book that, that always seemed a little curious to me was that uh, the Virginian and Molly are very clearly playing a game mm -hmm. against each other. Yeah. <laughs> they talked about who winning certain battles, right? And yeah. then eventually him winning, right? Uh, so there's, there's this game between uh, the male and the female. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you talk about how that game works? And, does that seem to be true that that is uh, that, that that's the way men and women work that they're really in this competition against each other? Um, I would, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I didn't go into too much detail about exploring that avenue just because there's so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, there's right, like even in, in Genesis, right? We get this this like. Um, Right. It's, it's part of a curse, right? That there's man and women are going to be constantly trying to dominate each other, right? And now, of course, I, I don't think that's how it always is, but there's still um, that at least that tendency. And I don't know, even with with friends, right? There's sometimes where you're like, you don't want to necessarily be equals. You want to like be above or, or below, right? That's kind of in a sense the, the way human beings are. Um, but, yeah, and also there's, um, yeah, right, men and women coming in, in into relationships, even good men and women, right, they, there's different ends that we're each wired for, more or less, right, just like if we're talking biologically speaking, right, um, women are more or less um, wired for, um, having a longer lasting relationship and, and children in the marriage setting where like I mean if we just kind of look at like dating sites, right? We get a lot of women who are like, I want a serious relationship. Whereas the guys are like, I'm looking for, you know, just fun tonight. <laughs> right? And so yeah, and and like I said, even in the best intention individuals, there's still just there's a part of the the animal nature that's like that, right? And there's a sense in which we have to mature beyond the um yeah, beyond that sh struggle as much as we can yeah and do they get there see yeah that's really interesting we don't we don't necessarily we, we see a lot of strife at the beginning right and we even get um where molly's the faithless one 
right? <clears throat> because she doesn't trust in the Virginian's abilities, right? She thinks that she, um, the Virginian's going to let her um, family down because he's uncivilized. And there's this constant sense that she's got this faithlessness. She, she doesn't believe in him, right? There's part that does, part that doesn't. Um, and I think in the honeymoon scene, right, we do see that harmony, right? They're, they're talking and interacting. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be more strife. There's just peace. I think we get a glimpse of that, and that's why they keep coming back, right, to the island. Um, every anniversary, they, they want to remind themselves and continue to have that. And I don't think it's a happily ever ending, a happily ever after book, right, because we would have ended the, the um, honeymoon scene. We get the continuation of that chapter, right, which is, and then the Virginian went and visited his in-laws, and that was awful. Plato's cave. They get to see the light, and then they go back into the cave. They get to see the light, they go back into the cave. And, yeah. and then we hear about everything else that the Virginian did. It's like, oh, and, you know, there's there's his son. He's like his dad. You know, we, we see this constant. There's this constant maturation, and it, it's continuing. There's never really a sense of perfection really actually reached, only momentarily. Yeah, this is a uh, this is another talk that's in danger of being you know useful as you could actually apply to your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's contrary to the PCC for now. No. <laughs> um, so one question I would like to ask. So regarding Molly, so at some point you talked about the Virginian. I think you used this word. Correct me if I'm wrong. But the Virginian, in some sense, became an equal to Molly in terms of you know reading enough books to become. And as much as Molly is sometimes disliked, right? <laughs> I feel sorry for Molly in that sense. It's like she worked her whole bad blame life to become you know a school teacher, well read, and then this you know upstart from the woods, or well he's from the woods and now he lives in the you know step. <laughs> right. Um, you know can can come up to her and equal her. So there's there's kind of two interlocking questions there. Does he did he and did he need to become her equal or just in some sense up here? Was that good enough? Did Molly actually in some sense retain? I'm I'm being sort of perhaps petty on behalf of Molly. Um, I don't know why I'm, I'm getting so engaged in defending her. Um, <laughs> did she did she keep anything in terms of she in fact did all this time that Virginia has spent you know playing the game of men and getting good at that. Molly has spent time playing a different game and actually getting good at it in some sense. Right. Does that continue to be something that, hey, she gets to be good at this in the relationship? And, you know, and the Virginian, of course, has the Brazilian Virginian things that he's good at. Right. Yeah. Um, so if I, I think of it as If you can extract a question from that, there is one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like more or less. Um, yeah, so I think one of the questions you asked was, did the Virginian need to become an equal? And I think... Did he need to become an equal? Right, right. I think in a sense they were already equals, in, in, and that's where the attraction was. Right? She rejected a lot of other guys and then acted really weird around him. Had he, like a 12-year-old, I don't know. <laughs> um, right, but yes, you play a game to, to mature, but there's also just a sense in which you can only mature to a certain point based on whatever you've been given, the hand you've been dealt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the hand that they've both been dealt, right, is this um, ability for adventure, right? They, like, if we look at Molly, why does she come out west? She does not want to be caught up in the trappings of the eastern world, of um, petty little titles and names, and if you, if you do work, then you're below... You know, below your station, but you should be, you know, she's more or less like a lady um, because of her background. But financially, they're not, they're nowhere near that. They're, they're poor. But, so she has to go work, but then she's looked upon less for working. And you don't see that so much in the West. And she's got all of her family expectations, right? That she, she just wants, to, she wants something that's real, right? And the Virginian, it seems that he leaves Virginia for something that's real, for some sort of experience. Um, It'll challenge. It'll challenge and mature. And I think that's where they're already equals. But the Virginian realizes some deficiency which he can fix. And 
in that regards. That's, that's why he wants to have conversations with you, like he wants to meet you in order to to become even more <coughs> Yeah, does that answer the question? Or yeah, you know? I mean, it's, it's certainly interesting world and stuff that, yeah, was, was, was very thought provoking. Um, one other thing, so we've got, and it seems, I think, fairly clear from your presentation, you know, from the book itself, that in some sense, Wister is aware that he's not presenting a full story of human development. Right, right. Um, and how well does he, in your assessment, how well does he succeed at that project? And in particular, I read the book and came away with a sense that things were often too easy for the Virginian. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, Does that kind of ruin some of this, you know, attempt at you know get, telling the story about playing the game and maturing and growing better if it's too easy? Right. Yeah. Th there's a sense in which yeah, the Virginian has just like phenomenal luck. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are the chances that actually Molly was interested in him, or the chances that he escapes the? The, the Indians trying to kill them, or like, what are the chances of all of those things, right? They're, they're pretty low, and sometimes, you know, we end up like Steve, we make one bad decision. <laughs> like one bad decision, he, he, he kills you, <laughs> right? Um, but that, in a sense, is part of the, the game in a, a different sense, right? That, that life throws things at you. Um, yeah, and I think Wister does a decent job at showing something that's realistic without having it be a, like a memoir, right? Like, it's not actual life accounts. I mean, there's some mixed in, but there's a lot of poetic uh, imagery there. Like, I don't know, but I don't see it as being any different necessarily as Odysseus, right? How many different times did he almost die? And, you know, like, he's, he's really lucky. And he goes and he kills, like, 20 men that are like half his age, <laughs> single-handedly, like, no, and, and that's kind of where we're allowed to, we're, we're kind of encouraged to exercise our imagination a bit, but we can certainly relate it to other things we've seen in life. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty realistic. Uh, yeah, I have some questions. Um, so, Games, like so many other things in life, uh, are are with us throughout history. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're always that any one of us is able to come up with a ready definition of what a game is. Um, he uses the word a lot, and as you suggested, very important uh, or prominent contexts. What is the game. What is? What do you think is a, a definition of the game that not necessarily drawn from modern game theory or anything, but just that Wister would agree with? Whatever a man was doing in the world of men. <laughs> wow, that's just doesn't sound. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That just sounds like life. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's. It seems a little strange. No. Um. Yeah. What would the game be according to history? I think, yeah, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot, a lot of different meaning parts, right? And in in the chapter, the game and the nation, what he first breaks into is this um, little digression, or it's it's the middle chapter between those three chapters, and it's quality and equity, right? There's um, it talks about there's a quality. Equity or equality? I'm sorry. Shoot. I think it's I think it's equality. I think it's equality. Yeah, equality and equality. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. And basically, but but just by talking about quality and equality, right? Quality being what you're the hand you're dealt as a human being, right? Um, whether or not you're you're in I guess in a more Darwinian fashion, like if you're actually capable of living life and uh, continuing to have children and continuing your line, right? There's there's that kind of idea of the hand you've been given, like what intellectual abilities you have, things like that. And we, we all know that there's different levels, right? And that's just kind of chance. Um, and then, of course, there's equality, where we're all given this, the same chance, same ability to um, level up accordingly, right? Okay, so in, in more philosophical categories, what would you, how would you describe equality? 
if we're equal, is, is that a natural equalness or an unnatural equality? Gotcha. Um, we're equal in the sense that we all have the same dignity, but it doesn't mean that um, we all have equal ability. There's, there's the, the moment where um, the Virginians verbally jousting with Molly, right? And, He's like, wow, it's really strange that we all claim that all men are created equal. She's like, I don't think that's so strange, you know. <laughs> He's like, well, I mean, you're just talking about, you know, your one student, and he's super smart, gets A's in all of his classes. Meanwhile, you've got that really dumb kid who's eating blue, <laughs> and you say we're all made equal, <laughs> right? They, um, yeah, there's, there is just so there seems to be ambiguity within the book itself, at least uh, within his thinking, as to equality versus quality, maybe. Maybe that's one of the things that has to be sorted out. Um, I just, I'll, I'll go a little bit further than the, turn it over to the floor. Uh, again, the more I've read this book, the more I've sensed that whether, <coughs> with full advertence or not, on his part, Wister really is working in a lot of uh, Pretty profound psychology and, uh, and philosophy of human nature, um, but in order to establish that thesis, one would have to again revert to philosophical categories. That's not his job. He's he's the the artist. Um, what about the idea of leveling up? What is that philosophically speaking? Uh, it would be um, movement towards perfection. So like. Yeah, movement towards perfection. If you think about it, in those terms, you've got a final end, right? And in this 